Okay, Rabbi Sai, we're on Daf Lamed Zayin Omed Aleph, and we're at the fifth line. We're, le- we're learning about the prusbol, and we learned that a prusbol is a mechanism whereby you can prevent shmita from wiping out a debt if you're a creditor, as long as you submit a specific debt that is owed to you by a borrower to Basin. Basin now becomes in possession of the debt, and that prevents the debt from being canceled. Amar of Yehuda Amar Shmuel, Yisom Emein Tzrichen Pruzbol, Mechein Tani Rami Bar Chama Yisom Emein Tzrichen Pruzbol, De Rabbi Gamliel Ubeis Dino, Avihen Shal Yisomim. So, first Shmuel makes a statement saying that orphans who, whose father leaves them as an estate, and part of the estate contains promissory notes that they have rights of collection, they do not need to draft a formal prusbol to submit to Bastin. It is implicit that Bastin represents their loans. And that's the Brisa is also stated by that way by Rami Barchama, who says that Rabban Gamliel, who was the the Av Bastin at the time when this Brisa was written, is the father of Yasomim. And therefore his Bastin already represents the Yasomim, so that a prusbol is not even necessary. <clears throat> Tanan Hasam, we have another Mishnah. Ein Kozvin Prusbol Ela Al Hakarka, Im Ein Lo Mezakehu Besoch Sadehu Kolshu. The Mishnah says that the only time that the rabbis made an accommodation of a Prusbol is if it's a normative loan. What is the definition of a normative loan? When the borrower has real estate security. If the borrower does not have real estate security, in most situations, he won't be able to find a creditor. He will not be able to find someone to lend him money. And so therefore, the rabbis, when Hillel first instituted Prusbol, he limited it to cases of loans where the loan is secured by real estate. Not so much that it has to be secured by real estate, but that the borrower owns real estate. In other words, even if it's an unsecured loan, in other words, it wasn't written in the loan specifically that the um, borrower places a lien on his property in order to get the loan, but the very fact that the borrower has real estate is the only time when you can use a prusbol. If the borrower owns no real estate, there's no accommodation of prusbol. So therefore, the Mishnah says, what should a guy do if he's lending someone money or he's already lent someone money and he's worried that Shemitah will wipe out the debt? He should be mezakeh. He should give as a gift a portion of his own real estate to the borrower and say, okay, I'll go over to my friend Yankel. Yankel, on behalf of the borrower, take possession of a piece, a little piece of my real estate, and that will belong to the borrower, and that way I can write a prusbol for that debt. The Kama Kol Shehu, what is a tiny piece of property? Like, what's the minimum size? Amar of Chia Bar Ashi, Amar Rav, Afilu Kelach Shel Kruv. Even a stalk of a cabbage is sufficient, because all you need is the tiniest little piece of something that's attached to real estate in order for this to work. Amar of Yehuda, Afilu Hishilo Makom Latanur Ula Kiraim Kosmanal of Prusbol. And that's true, even if the borrower does not own any real estate, but he has a place where he has to put his stove. Every person, even the poorest of people, has to have a stove to cook his food, right? So if he has a stove, even if he doesn't own the property that the stove is renting on, he's considered to be the borrower of that property, and that's sufficient to write a prusbol for him. So the Gemara says, Aini, is this really so? I mean, the, I guess the only time that a person could not be considered to have any real estate is if he's living in like a motel or something where all of the appliances don't even belong to him. And so therefore, in other words, there's no real estate. He's living in a high rise. There's no real estate that a guy really owns. Uh, but I'm not really sure. He, perhaps you could say that that apartment is the real estate. I'm not sure. So the Gemara says, Aini, is this really so that even if the guy... Uh, is borrowing a piece of property that his stove is resting on that sufficient? Vahatani Hillel ain Kosvin Prusbol Ella Al Atsitz Nakov Bilvad Nakov in Shaino Nakov Lo. Hillel the Amora, this is not the Hillel the Elder, the Hillel the Amora taught the following Brisa. He said that you can only write a Prusbol for a debtor that has a piece of property and a potted plant that has holes in the bottom is sufficient which means he's got something growing. 
What does that imply? That if it was a potted plant that didn't have any holes on it, then that would not be sufficient. So amai v'ha'ika makomo. What about the fact that the pot, potted plant is resting on a piece of real estate? There should be no worse than a stove that's resting on a piece of real estate. So doesn't that challenge what you've just said? The Gemara says, lo, tzricha demona chasichi. No. In reality, when he has an appliance that's resting on the ground, that's called that he owns real estate for, the, for, for these purposes. The, the case of the brysa that Hillel brought is where the potted plant is, is, uh, is resting above ground on pegs. In that situation, since it's not resting directly on the ground, if it doesn't have holes, it's not considered to be connected to real estate at all. If, however, it has holes on the bottom of it, then even if it's raised or elevated above the ground, it's still getting some kind of nutrition from the soil because of the holes in the bottom of the plant, and therefore that's also sufficient. Ravashi makni le gidma de dikla, of aleha prusbo. Ravashi, who wanted to be a creditor, uh, it, w- who would be able to use a prusbal to prevent Shemitah from wiping out the debt. So he gave the lender, uh, he gave the borrower rather, a tree stump. And that was his, he told him, this is your this is your tree stump. And on that basis, he was able to prevent the debt from being canceled. Rabbanan devei Ravashi masri milayu lahadadi. Now, the different rabbis from Ravashi's yeshiva, since they all sat on a basin, they felt justified, instead of going to a separate basin to submit their prusbal form to, they basically said, okay, you act as my basin, and the other guy said, okay, you act as my basin, and they just basically verbally said it to each other. They didn't even write up a star, since they were speaking directly to the, to, so to speak, quote-unquote, the basin, by speaking to the chaverim in the yeshiva, that was sufficient. And Rabbi Yonasan Masr Mili la Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Amar Lei Tzrich Namidi Achrina, Amar Lei Lo Tzrichas. And in a similar vein, Rabbi Yonasan verbally said to Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, I want to give you this debt that is owed to me, and I want to prevent uh, Shemitah from wiping it out. And Rabbi Yonas and, uh, uh, and Rabbi Chia sa- uh, said, fine. And so Rabbi Yonasan said, do I need to write out anything formally? He said, no. Once you've given it to me verbally, that is sufficient. And by the way, there are those poskim who say that even today, verbal instruction for a prusbal is sufficient. Our minog is to write it out. But bidiyevit, if a person, let's say it's the heir of Rosh Hashanah, and you can't find a piece of paper, if you just go over to three people and say, I'm, I'm g- giving you my debts, that's sufficient. Tanu Rabbanon, ain lo karka, vila arev yesh lo karka, kosmin alav prusbal. Lo vila arev ain lahem karka, vila chayev lo yesh lo karka, kosmin alav prusbal midir Rebbe Nasan. So the Brisa tells us two halachas. First of all, we know that the debtor has to have real estate. What if the debtor has no real estate, but his guarantor has real estate? Well, since therefore it's secured to a sufficient amount so that the, uh, the creditor can go to the uh, guarantor who has real estate, that's considered to be a basis for writing a prusbal. Uh, next, the Brysa says, what if the, both the borrower and the creditor have no real estate? However, Shimon, who's the debtor, is owed money by Levi. So Ruvain is the, fir- is the creditor, and Shimon owes him money. Shimon also, even though he owes Ruvain money, is also owed money by Levi. And Levi has real estate. So by virtue of the fact that Levi has real estate, Reuven can write a prusbol for the debt that is owed to him by Shimon. Why? Using Reb Nassim's principle. The Tanya Reb Nassim Oimer, Minayin lenosha bechavero mana, vechavero bechavero, Minayin shemotzin mizeh venostin lazeh, Talmud loimar venosan laasher asham lo. How do you know that if, if it's basically the transitive property in loans, how do you know that if Ruvain is a creditor of Shimon, and Shimon is a creditor of Levi, that how do you know that Ruvain can collect directly from Levi? We know this based on the Pasuk that says that the debtor shall give to whomever he owes, which means that even if he doesn't owe money directly to uh, Ruvain, but via Shimon he's going to eventually have to have his money paid to Ruvain, then that's sufficient. He's considered to be Ruvain's debtor. And therefore, if Levi has property, that's enough for Ruvain to write a prusbal on the debt that is owed to him by Shimon. I apologize for the noise. It's either mice or a squeaky heater. I prefer to think that it's a squeaky heater. Tanan Hassam. Okay, that's a squeaky heater. Tanan Hassam. 
Hashavias Mishanetis is Hamilva Bain Bishtar Bain Shalo Bishtar. So now the Mishnah says something else, and this is not related directly to Prusbal, although you'll see it's connected somewhat. Shemitah wipes out all debts, regardless of whether the debt was recorded in a shtar or not. Now that's what the Mishnah says, but we're going to see a machlokis is how do we interpret that statement, regardless of whether it is recorded in a shtar or not. Rav Ushmol Damri Taravayo Bishtar, Shtar Shiyesh Bo Achrayas, Nechasim, Shalo Bishtar Sheim Bo Achrayas Nechasim, Kol Shekein Milva Alpeh. So Rav and Shmuel understand that it means like this. All debts are wiped out at Shemitah, and whether it's written in a shtar or not means whether the shtar contains a lien on real estate or not. Meaning that, generally speaking, all, all loans are done with a shtar, with a promissory note. But sometimes a loan is secured by real estate, and sometimes it's not explicitly secured by real estate. So in all cases, Shemitah wipes out the loan, even when it's secured by real estate, and surely Shemitah will wipe out a loan that was only done verbally. But Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Tamri Turavayu, Bishtar, Shtar, Shein Bo Achrayis Nechasim, Shalo Bishtar Milva Alpeh, Abel Shtar, Sheyesh Bo Achrayis Nechasim, Eino Meshamet. But Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish, the Amorim of Eretz Yisrael, they disagree. They hold no. When the Mishnah says that uh, Shemitah wipes out a debt in a shtar, it's referring to an unsecured debt in a shtar. When they talk about when it's not in a shtar, it's wiped out. It's talking about a verbal loan without a promissory note at all. But what about a loan that is secured by real estate, by designated real estate? So that, says Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish, Shemitah does not wipe out. According to them, you don't even have to write a prusbal in a situation where the debtor actually specified real estate in the loan document, in the promissory note. If he said, I hereby have borrowed $100, and I hereby secure that debt by allocating my real estate as a, a payment for the debt, then that it doesn't even require prusbal because Shemitah doesn't have, have any effect on it at all, at all, according to Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. Now, so by the way, before what we were talking about is where the, the loyva has to own real estate, but it doesn't address whether he has to actually secure it in the note or not. As long as he owns real estate, you can write a prusbal. But here, what, we're, what Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan are suggesting is, is that if he actually explicitly secures the debt with real estate, then you don't even need a prusbal. Shemitah has no effect on that loan whatsoever. Tanya Kavase de Rabbi Yochanan of Shimon ben Lakish. We have a brisa now that supports this opinion. It says, Shtar chov meshamet v'im yesh bo achrayas nechasem eno meshamet. That's explicitly what the brisa says, that a, um, a promissory note is wiped out during Shemitah unless it was secured in the note with, with real estate. Tanya idach siyem lo sade echas bahalva'aso eno meshamet v'lo od ela afilu kasav kol nechas ayachron v'arvoin l'cha Eno Mishamit. Another Bryce says that if you designate a specific piece of property, you know, like my house on the corner of uh, York Hill and uh, and Hilda, right, then that surely will not be wiped out with Shemitah, that debt. But then the Bryce says, but even more than that, let's say a person has multiple holdings of real estate. The debt will not be wiped out, even if he just generically says, I secure the loan with all of my real estate holdings. Okay. So either there's going to be an explosion in five seconds, or... or it's, it's going to get warm in here. It's just going to... It's, everything, everything will be well. Can you talk to the caretaker? Yeah, I will, I will speak to him. Oh, you, oh, you did speak to him. Oh, you did speak to him. Yeah, it sounds like the hamster in the wheel up, up there is, uh, is just turning. Yeah. Okay, so now the Gemara tells us a story. It says, So once Rabbi Asi had a relative, some cousin or something, he had a, he had a shtarchov, he had a promissory note that had included in it that the debt was secured by real estate of the debtor. So the question is, does Shemitah wipe this out or not? So, Asa lekami de Reb Asi, Amr lei meshamet o eno meshamet, Amr lei eno meshamet. So he came to his cousin Reb Asi and he says, Cuz, tell me, does Shemitah wipe out this loan or not? So Reb Asi told him, 
Don't worry about it. Shemitah doesn't wipe out the loan. You can still have rights of collection. For whatever reason, I guess, you know, you know when you're related to a rabbi, you look at him as the, the little kid you used to play ball with, and so you don't respect what he has to say. So So he walked away, and he went to Rabbi Yochanan to find out, look, my cousin gave me a heter, who, but maybe he's just like some, you know, doesn't know anything. So he came to the great Rabbi Yochanan, and Amr Mishamit. And Rabbi Yochanan says, I'm sorry, the debt is wiped out through Shemitah. So also Rabbi Asi lekamid Rabbi Yechon and Armalei Mishamit or Ena Mishamit Armalei Mishamit. So when Rabbi Asi heard about this, he goes to Rabbi Yechon and says, "Tell me, Rabbi, does Shmita wipe out such a debt or not?" And Rabbi Yechon says, "I'm sorry, Shmita wipes it out." But wait a minute, he said, "Vaha Marhu da Amar Ena Mishamit." But one second, you yourself, Paskin, we just quoted you with Reish Lakish is saying that if the debt is secured by real estate of the debtor, then it doesn't get wiped out. So Amr Levi, Shano, Medame, Naasa, Maisa. So Rabbi Yechanan said, it's one thing to academically proclaim something, but it's another thing to practically paskin that way. He says, from an academic point of view, it makes sense for us to rule that the debt should not get wiped out. Uh, but... Um, I'm not prepared to pask in that way, uh, in, uh, to be so um, so flippant about Shemitah. I'm not prepared to be to, to pask in. So Amar Leva Hatanya Kavase Demar. So Rabasi says, but there's a brisa that supports you. Why wouldn't you be prepared to pask in like the brisa? So Amar Lei Dil Mahahi Beishamahi Dar Mishtar Haomid Legavos Kigavui Dami. He says, because I'm worried that maybe that b'risa that supports my contention goes according to Beishamai, and we don't paskin like that b'risa. Mm-hmm. Now, what did Beishamai say? Beishamai say that any time a person is holding a promissory note, we view it as if he's already holding the cash. Mm-hmm. And we view, therefore, the holder of the note as the muchzak. Basilel disagree. Basilel say that just because you're holding a promissory note doesn't mean that you're the muchzak. And therefore, in cases of suffolk, where you have to award the money to the muchzak, to the possessor, we don't say that the holder of the promissory note is the possessor. And that's, that's the reason why, says, uh, says Rabbi Yochanan, perhaps Shemitah does wipe out the debt, even though the guy's holding a note that has a, that has a uh, security of real estate in it. Okay, Tanan Hasam. Let's go on to the next Mishnah. Hamalvis, I mean, this is the Mishnah being quoted by the Gemara. Hamalvis chaveru mos al hamashkon, that if you lend a friend money, and he secures it with chattel, which means you lend him a hundred bucks, and he gives you his kiddush cup as collateral, and you bring the kiddush cup into your house. You're like a pawn shop, right? Or vahamoser shtaros of lebeistin, or if a person hands over his shtaros to beistin, which is uh, which is like the most effective form. It's like even more powerful than Prusbol because you're actually formally submitting the promissory notes over to Beistin. Ein Mishamtin. So in those cases, Shemitah does not wipe out the debt. So the Gemara says, Bishlam Amoser Shtaros of Lebeistin Tafsi Luhu Beidina. So I can certainly understand the second case where Beistin is now in possession of your debts. It's no longer a personal debt, and therefore Shemitah doesn't wipe out the debt. Ela milva al hamashkon my taima, but why is it that if there's a, a loan that's made with uh, uh, collateral, why does that debt not wiped out by shemitah? There's no real estate involved. So Amar Rava mishum de tafasle. So Rava says because when I'm holding the I'm, if I'm the lender and I'm holding your kiddush cup, so then the debt is not wiped out. And let me just explain the principle here. The Torah says that. Lo yigos es reu ves achiv ki kara shemita lashem. That when shemita comes, you may not oppress or pressure your brother for repayment of the debt because he calls out shemita to God. So what we learn from that pasuk is that only when you are pressuring someone for payment of the debt do we say that shemita comes in and saves him. But let's say I don't need to pressure a guy to pay back the debt because I've already got his kiddush cup. I'm not going to come to you and demand payment. If you don't show up by the, by the time the loan is due, I'm just going to keep the Kiddush cup. So there's no pressure involved. And based on that Pasuk, we learn that when a person's holding collateral of the debtor, 
and he can just keep the collateral without having any more interchange with the debtor and pressuring him, so then Shemitah does not wipe out that debt. That's the reason, says Rava. So Amr le Abaye Elameata Hilveu Vidar Bachatzeru the Tafis Lehachanami Delo Mishamet. So Abaye says, Are you suggesting that the same would hold true? Is that let's say I'm, I've lent money to Yankel and I happen to be a tenant living on Yankel's property. Does that mean because I'm currently sitting on his property, I'm possessing a portion of his property, that Shemitah will not wipe out that debt? So shiny mashkon So he said, no, real estate is different from from chattel. He says, when you're holding on to chattel, you mamish become the possessor of that chattel based on Rabbi Yitzchak Salacha. The Amr Rabbi Yitzchak minayin lebalchov shekayna mashkon. Rabbi Yitzchak says, how do you know that a balchov, as soon as he takes possession of that kiddush cup, he's considered the possessor? Shenemar ulachati etzdaka. The Torah says. That um, that when the sun goes down, if a guy has lent you his pajamas, he's, he's given you his pajamas as his collateral, then at the end of the day, you have an obligation, if he's a poor man and he's only got one set of pajamas, you got to bring him his pajamas at nighttime so that he has something to go to sleep with, or a blanket, or whatever it is, you know? So, and, and the Torah says that by doing so, that it'll be considered an act of charity if you do this. So Rabbi Yitzchak says, why is it considered an act of charity? If, uh, if, 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 if you, can't give, you can't do an act of tzedakah with something that does, it doesn't belong to you. So from the wor- verbiage of the Pasuk, you see, you see that as soon as the creditor takes possession, physical possession of the collateral, it's as if it's his already. And that's the reason why Shemitah doesn't wipe it out. But if I'm merely living as a tenant on your property, I'm not in possession of your property. I'm, I'm, I'm renting from you, and therefore Shemitah will wipe out that debt if I've lent you money. Okay, Tanan Hasam. Let's look at another mission. So the Mishnah says a very interesting halacha. If a guy after Shemitah, we know that Shemitah wipes out debts at the last day of Shemitah, the last moment of Shemitah is when the debts are wiped out. Let's say my friend comes over to me, Yankel comes over to me at the end of Shemitah and says, I want to pay you back the loan that I owe you. So I, I have an obligation to tell him, I have to verbally tell him, Mishametani. I'm sorry, Shemitah has already elapsed, and I'm obligated to forgive the loan because of Shemitah. So if the friend, if Yankel says back to me, Afal Pichain, that's okay, I still want to give it to you even though I'm not legally bound to do so, so then I'm allowed to take the money from him. And Omar Rabbah, Vitali Le'ad Omar Hachi. Rabbah says a big chiddush. Based on this price, now first of all, what's the reason that I verbally have an obligation to tell this to the debtor? The reason is because the Torah says, V'zed devar ha You have to actually um, verbalize the laws of Shemitah. So if someone wants to violate the law of Shemitah by paying me back the loan, I have to verbalize to him, hey, the law of Shemitah says that you don't owe me the money. Okay, so that's that's this, the price of it. Rabbi comes along and says a big chiddush. And he says, if a guy comes with the money, I have an obligation to say, Tani, the loan is forgiven because of Shemitah. However, if he doesn't say, Afal Pichain, and I'm a Talmud Chacham, and I'm a Groiser Starker, I'm a big, strong guy, I can pick him up, hang him up on the tree, and tell him, um, did you want to say, perhaps, Afal Pichain? Did you perhaps want to say that I'm willing to pay you back anyway? And if he says, yes, I'm allowed to take the money from him. In other words, I can do any kind of physical coercion that I need to in order to get the guy to say, Afal Pichain. So, but it's only when he comes back to me to pay back the loan and he unknowingly wants to pay it back, I have to say, but once we're put in that position, I can pressure him to say, in order to get him to give me the money. So, So, Abaye says, how can you say that, Rabbah? He says, the, the, the Mishnah says that, or the Brisa says that when a person wants to give back money that already was canceled, the, the debt was canceled by Shemitah, you cannot say as a debtor, I'm paying you back the debt, but rather you have to say, I know the money is mine legally, but I want to give it to you as a matana. 
So how can a guy, how can you suggest that a guy can be strung up on a tree until he's coerced to say, I'm willing to give it to you? That's not a matana. So, Amar lei, tali lei nami ado Amar hachi. You hang him up on a tree until he says, I want to give it to you as a gift. So if you tell him, if he says, I really don't want to give this to you, but you give me no choice, you say, no, 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 change that statement just a little bit. <laughs> you see Guido over there, he doesn't like the way you said it. Maybe say it a little differently and Guido will be happy, right? And so the guy says, okay, I want to give it to you as a gift. Ah, that's much better. Okay, Guido, you can let him down now. Don't break his legs. So that's basically what the Gemara is presenting as the scenario. So Abba Bar Marta Duhu Abba Bar Minyumi have a Masik Bey Rabba Zuzay. Now, Abba, and someone maybe tell me the background, I don't remember exactly the background of the story. This fellow Abba went by two names, Abba Bar Marta and Abba Bar Minyumi. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that at one point his father was Megayer. I think that's why originally he was called by his mother's name, and later he was called by his father's name. Does anyone have a record of that in their Gemara? I'm not, I don't remember the story for sure, but I think that's what happened. In any event, he was a debtor. He owed money to Rabba, and I sinu ni And Abba brought him the money after Shemitah was finished, after the debt had been canceled. So Amar mishamet ani. So Rabba says, you know, Shemitah canceled the debt. So shaklinhu va'azal. So Abba said, oh great. He took his money and he walked away. So asa abaye ashkacha dahava atziv. Amar amai atziv mar. So Abaya sees Rabba, and he sees that Rabba's all upset. Abaya says, why are you upset? So he tells him the whole story with Abba. I don't, I don't get my money back. So So he goes to Abba, and he says, Abba, did you bring back the money that you owed Rabba? He says, yeah, but he told me that he's Mishami. He told me that the debt is canceled. So Amar Lei via Martle Afal Pichain Amar Lei Lo. So he asked, so Abaya said, but Abba, did you tell him Afal Pichain that even so you want to give it to him? So Abba said, no, I never, I never, I never said that. I just took the money home. So Amar Lei via Martle Afal Pichain Habe Shaklinu Mina Chashda Miha Samtinu Niha Lei Veema Lei Afal Pichain. So Abaya says, listen, my friend, this is the Ehrlich thing to do. This is the right thing to do. If you would have said Afal Pichain, Rabba would have taken the money. So therefore, what you should do now, even though there's been some time that's elapsed, go back to him, say Afal Pichain, and give him the money. So Azal Amtinu Nihalev, Amar Lei Afal Pichain, Shaklinu Minay. And that's exactly what happened, and Rabba took the money. So Amar Lo Hava Beit Aita Bahit Surva Merabon and Meikara. So Rabbi said, didn't this fellow have enough seichel in, uh, in the first place? In other words, like Rabbi was saying, like, why didn't the guy just say Afo Piche in, uh, in the first place? Put me through all of this Agma Snefesh. Anyway, basically he was saying that uh, he didn't really have enough knowledge in order to know to, know to do this. Amar of Yehuda, Amar of Nachman, Neman Adam Lomar, Prusbal HaYabiyadi, Va'avad Mimeni. My time I came in the Tekina Rabban and Prusbal, Oshave Ketera, Va'achil Isura. So Rav Nachman says that a person is believed to say, if he wants to collect the debt after Shemitah, he can go to Bastin and say, Raboisai, I know that Shemitah has already elapsed, but I, I, I had a prusbal. I wrote up a prusbal, I gave it to Bastin, and, the base, and then, so they say, well, then where's the, where's the receipt of the prusbal? He says, I, I lost it. The guy is believed. And the reason he's believed is because once the Chachamim made an accommodation of Prusbal, we assume that everyone's going to avail themselves of it. Why would a person not avail himself of such an accommodation and try to collect something in a forbidden fashion? So, so there was once a Misa where a fellow tried to collect the debt after Shemitah, and he came to Bastin, and uh, Rob said to him, is it possible that perhaps you had written a prusbal and it got lost? And the guy said, oh yeah, that's right, there was a prusbal. So we see from here that not only can the guy's claim be believed that he wrote a prusbal, but the dying can even encourage him to make that argument. And this is based on the saying of open up your mouth to the mute and, and provide him with, with whatever he needs. So let's look at the Mishnah. The Mishnah in Shviya says that that's not the halacha, the halacha, or ksuvis rather. It says that the halacha is that if there's a creditor 
who wants to collect the loan after Shemitah and he doesn't have a bowl, then you don't pay him. So if you just told me that uh, you do pay him if he, as long as he says it got lost, how do you reconcile that? So the Gemara says Tanoi. It's actually a machlokas Tanoim. The Tanya Hamotzi Shtar Chov Tzorch Shehim Oprusbol Bechachamim Omrim Eino Tzorch. The Tanakama says, if you want to collect the debt after Shemitah, you better show the Prusbol. And the Chachamim say that you don't even need to show the Prusbol. As long as you say you did a Prusbol, that is sufficient. So it's a machlokas. Fine. Let's go on to the next Mishnah. The next Mishnah of the verbiage is a little bit cryptic, but we'll unpack and explain everything momentarily. Evet shenishba upida uhu. The Mishnah's topic is an Evet Kanani who was owned by a Jew. He gets captured by Gentiles, by Ovde Kochavim, by bandits, by vandals, okay? And another Yid, out of the goodness of his heart, decides to ransom him back. So the question is, number one, is the Evid still an Evid? And number two, whose Evid is he, if he is still an Evid? So, Imlushum Evid Yishtabed. Imlushum Ben Chorin Lo Yishtabed. So the Tanakhama says that if he was ransomed uh, on, for, this, for the purpose of being an Evid, he remains an Evid. And if he was ransomed for the purpose of going free, he goes free. The Rabbi Shimon Gamliel Oimer Ben Kach Uven Kach Yishtab. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says, no, it doesn't work that way. If he, if he was captured as an Evid, he remains an Evid, regardless of what the person who ransomed him had in mind. Okay, let's take a look at the Gemara and unpack this discussion. But my asking, what are we talking about? So if we're talking about a case, let's say Ruvain was the original owner of this Evid and uh, the guy gets captured, Ruvain has not given up hope of retrieving his Evid, and Shimon, in the meantime, out of the goodness of his heart, goes and ransoms him. But if Ruvain never had Yeush, had never given up hope of retrieving him, has never relinquished ownership of the Evid, why should the fellow become a free man just because Shimon ransomed him on that condition? The, the law should be that he should go back to being Ruvain's slave. And if you're going to tell me that we're talking about a case of where Reuven already gave up uh, uh, ever hope of ever retrieving him and therefore relinquishes ownership of him, then if Shimon ransoms him, then why should the fellow become an Evid again? He shouldn't become an Evid again. Uh, Reuven relinquished ownership of him. So, Amr Abayi la'olam lifnei yeyush, l'shum evid yishtabid l'rabo rishon, l'shum ben chorin lo yishtabid lo l'rabo rishon v'lo l'rabo sheni. So Abayi says, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a case where Reuven has not had yeyush. Shimon goes ahead and ransoms him. If Shimon ransomed him for the sake of being an evid, then he has to return back to the first master because it's Reuven's property. If, however... Shimon ransomed him for, for the sake of him becoming a free man, so then he does not become a slave either to Ruvain or to Shimon. Now technically he's still Ruvain's slave, but Bastin can decide at their own discretion to declare him, using Hefker, Bastin, Hefker, to declare him a free man. And why did they step in over here? The answer is Daha uh, Lushum um, Ben Chorin Parke. So I'm sorry. So let's lo parke. He does not become a slave to the to Shimon because Shimon didn't uh, ransom him for that purpose. Shimon ransomed him to be a free man. And parke. And he doesn't go back to being a slave of Reuven, you know why? Because the halacha according to the Tanakhama is that there's only a mitzvah of pidyon shvuyim, of ransoming captives, if you're a Jew, not if you're an Evid Kanani. And therefore, if Shimon ransoms him under the pretense or under the understanding that he that this fellow is either is a Jew or is going to become a Jew through being ransomed, if we tell Shimon that no, he goes back to being an Evid Kanani of Ruvain, so then Shimon's not going to want to ransom him in the first place. And this fellow is going to remain a captive. And so therefore the Chachamim said, because the halacha is that there's only a mitzvah of pidyon shfuim on Jews, and we want this Evi Kanani to eventually go free, let's declare him free so that people will feel, that, feel duty-bound to perform the mitzvah to, to, to ransom him and, and to have him released. That, so it's basically a tzakana. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel Omer Ben Kach Uven Kach Yishtabed. That's why Rabbi Shimon Gamliel disagrees. He says, no, even if Shimon ransomed him to be a free man, 
uh, he still goes back to being Ruvain's Eved. Ksover, Keshem Shemitza Liftos as Ben Bnei Chorin, Kach Mitzvah Liftos as Avodim. Because Rabbi Shimon Gamliel is of the opinion that the Mitzvah of Pidyon Shvuyim applies equally to Jews and to Avodim Kenanim. And therefore, no one's going to be disincentivized to redeem him just because they know he's going to remain Ruvain's Eved. If there's a Mitzvah of Pidyon Shvuyim, people will do it even if he's an Eved. And therefore, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says, this is the way Abai is learning the Machlokes, that it's before Yehosh, the guy always remains as Ruvain's Eved. Rava Amar Laolam Laachar Yehosh, Ulushum Eved Yishtabi Larabo Sheni, Lushum Ben Choren Lo Yishtabi Lola Rabo Rishon Lola Rabo Sheni. So Rava has a totally different way of understanding the Machlokas in the Mishnah. Rava says we're talking about after Yehosh. Ruvain has already given up hope and has therefore relinquished his rights to this Eved. So what are we talking about? In a situation where Shimon ransoms him for the sake of being an Eved, he becomes Shimon's Eved. Not Ruvain's Eved, he becomes Shimon, the ransomer's Eved. But if he, Shimon ransomed him for the sake of being a free man, so then he becomes free both from Ruvain and from Shimon. So let's explain this. He certainly doesn't become Shimon's Eved because Shimon freed him for the purpose of being free. And the Rabbo Risha Nami Lo Dahala Acher Yehosh Hava. And he doesn't go back to Reuven because Reuven already had Yehosh, he already relinquished ownership. And Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel Omer Ben Kachu Ben Kachi Shtabit Kidichizkiya. And Rabbi Shimon Gamliel disagrees. He says no. In all situations, he will go back to becoming Reuven's Eved, even though Reuven already had Yehosh. Now, why is that? Because the Omer Chizkiya Mipnei Ma Omer Ben Kachu Ben Kachi Shtabit Shlo Yeh Kol Echad Veechad. He says, because the Chachamim stepped in and made a Takana. If Avodim Kenanim would get wind of this idea, that all they have to do in order to get themselves liberated is to get captured by bandits, and then the owner will have Yehush. So all every Avod Kenani is going to is going to make a deal with the uh, with the with a bandit saying, here, capture me, hold me for ransom for a long time, and eventually you'll let me go, I'll pay you whatever it's going to cost, and I'll, I'll, I'll be a freed Evid. So therefore the Chachamim stepped in and made a takana that even though Reuven has had Yehush, you still have to go back to become an Evid of Reuven in a situation where Shimon ransoms you, and it doesn't matter whether he ransomed you for a ben and he ransomed you for an Evid, it doesn't matter. So So let's now challenge the second interpretation of that Rava gave. So the Gemara says like this, we are the Brisa seems to side with Abaya's interpretation. Because Abaya said we're talking about a case where the owner, Aruvain, did not have Yeyush yet. And the whole reason that when he's uh, redeemed, he, even if you redeemed him, says Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, for the sake of being a free man, he goes back to becoming Ruvain's Eved. So Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says is because uh, uh, the uh, is is the reason why the Chachamim are not concerned about uh, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel's concern that no one's going to want to ransom him if they know that he's going to go back to being an Eved is because what is because uh, there's a mitzvah just as much of a mitzvah to redeem Avodim as there is to redeem regular Jews. So therefore, no one's going to be disincentivized to redeem him if they know that he's going to go back to becoming an Evid. So that, that clearly sounds like the way Abai is learning. But according to you, Rava, the, the argument of the Chachamim should not be Kishem, just like there's a mitzvah to redeem Jews, there's a mitzvah to redeem Avodim. The argument should be like Chizkiya said, that the guy goes back to becoming Ruvain's Evid, even though he already had Yeyush, because of a concern of Chizkiya, that every Evid's going to want to go create a situation where he gets captured. So Amr Lecha Rava, so Rava will tell you like this, Rav Shimon Gamli Elo HaViyad HaMai Karmi Rabban and Vachik Amr Lehu. So Rava says, let me explain to you. Rav Shimon Gamli wasn't even sure how the Chachamim were paskining. Are they paskining on a case before Reuven has Yeish or even after Reuven has Yeish? So he said to them as follows, I lifnei Yeish ka'am risu hainu kishen. I la'achar Yeish ka'am risu kidechizkiya. He was saying things like this. He says, listen, guys, if you're telling me that uh, if you, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, um, in other words, if you, the Chachamim, say 
that if the second guy rans- if Shimon ransomed him for the sake of being uh, a Ben Chorin, that he becomes a Ben Chorin, if you're talking about before Yeush, he says, then Kishem. He says, no. So Rab Shimon Gamliel says to them, listen, just like there's a mitzvah of, uh, of pidyon shvuyim for avadim, there's a mitzvah of pidyon shvuyim for, uh, just like the mitzvah of pidyon shvuyim for Jews, there's a mitzvah of pidyon shvuyim for avadim, and therefore, there's no concern that we have to let this guy go free. He, be, he's, he remains his Ruvain slave, and no one will be disincentivized from doing pidyon shvuyim. And if you're talking about after Yeish, which is like the way Rav says, I interpret the Mishnah, then you can use Chizkiah's argument. What's, what's Rabbi Shimon Gamliel saying back to the Chachamim? That how can you let this guy go free? Every Ebed Kanani is going to use the, this collusion in order to be able to free himself from his master. And therefore, in all situations, he goes back to being Ruvain's slave. So now the Gemara says, Ula Rav da'amar la'achar yeyosh ula Rav O'Sheni, Rav O'Sheni miman kani lay. Um, so the Gemara's question is like this. According to Rav, where you said that Ruvain has had yeyosh, and therefore if Shimon re- ransoms him for the sake of Avdus, he becomes Shimon's Evid. But how does he become Shimon's Evid? Who was he Kona him from? Ruvain relinquished ownership, so he should, he should become a free man. How does Shimon now acquire him as an Evid Kanani? Who does he acquire him from? So the Gemara answers, Mishavoy, from his Gentile captors, yes. The Gemara says, how can that be? Shavoy gufe mi So how can, they, uh, how, can they, how can they acquire him? He's been freed by Ruvain. So the Gemara says, in Konile Lamase Yodov, yes, it is possible. It's true that they can't acquire him as a slave to own his body as a slave, but they certainly can acquire his labor. That's what Masse Yodim is, that I own you vis a vis the labor that you produce. The Amr Reish Lakish Minayin La'obik Chachavim Shakane Es La'obik Chachavim Lamaisi Yadav. Because Reish Lakish says, how do you know that one Gentile can acquire another Gentile, not in body, but at least to be, have him become an indentured servant where he's obligated to work for him? Shenamar Vigami Bnei Hatoshavim Hagarim Imachem Mehem Tiknu. Because based on the pasuk, the Torah says that that you are able to acquire slaves from the descendants of the residents of the land up in, into which you're coming. So, atem konim mehem, velohem konim mikem, velohem konim zemizeh. You can acquire slaves from them, says the Torah. But they may not acquire you as slaves, nor can they acquire each other as slaves. Then the Bryce continues says, you might think that they cannot acquire each other. So wait, stop, stop right there, says the Gemara. You just told me that they cannot acquire each other. So why are you going into this possibility that they cannot acquire each other? You just told me they cannot acquire each other. Gemara says, Hachi Kamar. Velohem konim zemize legufa, that they cannot acquire each other to own the the servant as a bodily possession, as as a piece of chattel. But yachol lo yiknu ze ezelamaisi yadav. But then you might think that if they cannot acquire them bodily as slaves, maybe they cannot acquire their their labor, their commitment to work for them. So amart kal v'chomer. So you can say the following kal v'chomer. Obi kochavim Yisrael koyne, obi kochavim. So the Gemara says like this, that a Goy can acquire a Jew as a slave for his Masa Yadayim to become an indentured servant. So surely if that's so, then surely an Obi can acquire another Obi Kochavim for his Masa Yadayim, for his labor. Notice, we know that a Goy can acquire a Jew for his labor because the Torah says that if you find the Jew in that state, then you have a mitzvah to try and redeem him and buy him back. It's not that the Jew, is his body is owned by the goy, but he's sort of indentured as far as his labor to a goy. And that teaches me that one goy can acquire another. So essentially what happens is like this. Ruvain relinquishes ownership because he has yeyush. The captors then acquire him, not bodily, but they acquire him as far as his labor. And that ownership of his labor can be passed on to Shimon, who buys him for the sake of Abdus. Rabbis said that says that will work as long as Shimon purchased him for that purpose. And we'll continue with this discussion, Mirza Shem, tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.